Thank you, everybody, for this uh, long, uh, sorry about all this technical problem. This is Joe Ross, uh, one of the PIs of the Yale Mayo Clinic, Circe, and, and I am delighted to have Harlan Krumholtz, uh giving the Circe lecture for today, and I, I know that we're a bit behind. Um, Harlan is not only, you know, what a, he's a cardiologist, professor of medicine, school of, uh, school of medicine, school of public health, my, my longtime mentor, and he is going to be speaking today about people and their data, leveraging the digital transformation for a new era of knowledge generation. So thank you, Harlan, for sticking with us. And, <laughs> and uh, I thank anyone who's still on the call, and we're very sorry for the technical problems. And I actually want to say that my FDA colleagues were very conscientious. There was a run-through yesterday, and we had it working. We set this up a half hour before this call, and then as would happen just before the call started, uh, we technical difficulties began. So I apologize to the audience. I appreciate your sticking through. And and I also want to say that uh, I don't know what else my colleagues could have done to prepare better for this. So let me just try to go through this uh, presentation um, with some speed. I want to present my disclosures, a prominent of which is that I'm a founder of Hugo, a platform to enable people's agency over their health data and the means to use it as they choose, and that's a big theme of this talk, so I want to make sure that that's, that's clear. So the title of this was People and Their Data, but the long title really was People and Their Data, Leveraging the Digital Transformation for New Era of Knowledge Generation, and that's, that's a mouthful, but the principal thing is that um, I, I think we're at this critical juncture where things can change and where we can begin to think differently about the way in which we're generating knowledge within the healthcare system. And I, I sort of liken it to the change that occurred with the transcontinental railway. And I, and I put this in here because, you know, at that time people were thinking about how we're going to improve speed and, and move things across the country and solve the problems that we have with regard to the transportation system. And if they were thinking the same way that they'd always thought before, they'd think, well, on the wagon trains, how do we, well, maybe six horses isn't enough. Maybe we should use eight horses, or maybe we should use 12 horses. Or, and, you know, that kind of thinking w would never have accomplished. They had to think differently about their approach in order to fundamentally shift the performance of the entire system and to transform the way in which people's lives were. And... And I think we're, we're at, a, at a point here where we have to think about that in the knowledge generation system. And, and I want to just take a moment to, to give some tribute to some of the sources of inspiration for me around some of these ideas. And, and they're the people who are living life with particular health challenges but have refused to let it, it deter them or daunt them or slow them and who've been thinking hard about how to make positive change in the system and how they can become part of it. This is Sarah Gari, a person who lives with Parkinson's disease, and, and she taught me this notion of what time means to people who are living with progressive, potentially debilitating, in some cases, life-threatening illness, and how they think about time and the need for knowledge in a way that's actually different than many of the rest of us do, even as we're trying to push forward knowledge all the time. Uh, Hugo Campos is another person who has been a champion for people sharing data and and using that data for uh, uh, purposes that would both help individuals empower them, but also to push forward knowledge generation. Of course, Sharon Terry, who has had a remarkable story with her children and the ways that she's been able to have us think differently about this. The patient Dave, who wrote a book that said Let Patients Help, which really could be a theme of a lot of this work. And uh, Liz Salini, who's uh, another person that I've met along this journey who has been quite a vocal advocate, she's at the Liz Army on Twitter and has been able to galvanize a lot of energy and interest among those who are facing health challenges to say that you people who are working in the fields that are generating knowledge are, are trying to help understand the healthcare system's functioning, the safety and effectiveness of devices and drugs. You need to know what it's like for those of us who are waiting for that information or living it in the degree to which we want to participate and be part of it. The central problem that I want to pose is that the scientific enterprise as it currently exists cannot keep pace with the information needs of people and patients. In another talk, I said it's woefully inadequate 
it hardly begins to meet in, in any way, shape, or form the needs that we have. And I'll say, just don't take my word for it. So this is an FDA platform. So let me quote the previous FDA commissioner who said, as a clinician, investigator, and most recently as FDA commissioner, I've become keenly aware of the large and growing gaps in the evidence available to guide decisions about health and health care. And in fact, uh, Dr. Califf, along with several other investigators, had previously published a study where they looked at the evidence that was behind the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology Clinical Practice Guidelines, arguably some of the best and most comprehensive guidelines that are published. And although I am a cardiologist, I, I, I think I can say this fairly, that the cardiovascular uh, field has been a, one of those that has generated some of the most evidence that exists in medicine for the conditions in our area. And yet only 11% of the guideline recommendations were based on class A evidence, the very best evidence, clinical trial evidence. And about half of the opinions, uh, about half of the recommendations in the guidelines, half were based only on expert opinion. So that in an era of evidence-based medicine, we are not generating the amount of evidence that can apply to people's lives. And, and by the way, this is largely about average evidence because it's coming from trials and so very controlled settings. So our class A evidence is evidence that's being generated about a very narrow segment of the population and a, a group that sometimes and too often may not resemble uh, the real world because of the restrictions that are imposed in a clinical trial, we end up getting a, a population that's more homogeneous than we would like and one that's not necessarily reflective of the, of the complex uh, uh, characteristics of patients and their backgrounds and the demographics that are more typical of the patients that are seen in practice. In this document that was produced by the FDA uh, uh, just in January, um, there was also, I think, the clear statement that many of the healthcare decisions we make today are not supported by the kind of high quality evidence currently derived from randomized clinical trials or well-designed observational studies. And one of, in one of his last accomplishments, uh, Dr. Califf assembled a, a representative, I would say a group that was very representative of the leaders of almost all the agencies within HHS and uh, the head of the National Academy of Medicine, Victor Zhao, and uh, other leaders from organizations like PCORI to come together in a sounding board on transforming evidence generation to support healthcare decisions. And he got this group, which is hard to get them despite their talent and interest and alignment of, of, of uh, trying to push forward what's best for society. It's not necessarily easy to get up all of them to align around a, a sort of common set of, of uh, assumptions. But they said they know in this, in this statement, we know that when people make choices about health and health care without adequate evidence to inform them, these choices can be ineffective at best and at worst can cause actual harm. They, they, what they were saying was that it's not just that we're ignorant of certain, in certain areas or that we're expressing expert opinion, but that actually we recognize that harm is accruing. That harm can sometimes have financial consequences. In a report from the Office of the Inspector General that was produced in September of uh, this year, uh, there was an estimate, they said, we estimate that services related to the replacement of uh, seven recalled and prematurely failed medical devices cost Medicare $1.5 billion during calendar years uh, 2005 through 2014. And the, the implication here is uh, not necessarily that the uh, these devices were inappropriately approved, but that we could have learned earlier as they began to spread in the in the post market period. We could have learned earlier that there were problems that existed, but that the inadequacy of our current systems to be able to learn quickly end up not only uh, costing lives, which is the most important thing, costing harm, which is a very important thing, but also ending up uh, costing uh, the healthcare system resources that could be uh, put in other places. Now this document from the FDA FGEM that came out in, in January 2017, the, the, one, of the, one of the things that was said was that fortunately, rich diverse sources of digital data are increasingly available for research and analytical tools continue to grow in power and sophistication. 
So th this document is acknowledging this problem and saying, well, but there's something good news about where we stand now because digital data and the analytical power are, are progressing. And this is coming at a time when it's being increasingly recognized that medicine's emerging as an information science. And not only that, but in order for us to make progress within medicine and the, sort of at its essence, this issue around the information science, is that we're moving towards a precision medicine construct that although there's been a lot of, uh, of highlighting of biologic factors and genomics, ultimately in its underpinnings is going to be just be about data, data coming from a whole range of different um, sources and then being understood in the ways that they interact with each other. And I, I put that in your systems biology because there's a real recognition within systems biology that we don't it's not that we've got different effects that are occurring singularly, but when things occur together, that the kind of phenomenon that can emerge can be very different than what might be predicted from just considering them separately. And this is, for example, when disease occurs in the context of, of, of low resources, it can have a very different consequence than, than in a situation where resources are abundant. Take diabetes, for example, very different disease in, a, in the setting of uh, low resources and with very different consequences for health. Now, this good news about the explosion in health data uh, should give us uh, hope for the future. Uh, people have projected remarkable, remarkable growth in the amount of data that's going to be available. Watson uh, Health uh, Promotion uh, said that the, and we'll just take this at face value, the average person is likely to generate more than a billion gigabytes of health-related data in their lifetime in the current era and into the future, equivalent to 300 million books. Of course, uh, the issue is going to be how that is put to good use, and but the data is coming from everywhere, and, and even from unlikely places. I mean, here we know that the Internet and home broadband and smartphones and tablets and social media are, are increasing rapidly in their penetration within the society and in their everyday use. Streaming data about our behaviors, our activity, and a whole range of other things. But this figure from Pew also shows how this is increasing even among people 65 and older. And such that, uh, well, people that we normally thought would have maybe been isolated from this kind of data and this kind of, this kind of digital technology are now adopting it in, in quite remarkable ways and in unexpected ways. In addition, wearables, I mean, all of you are familiar with this, the data stream from all sorts of different places, and including data collection now that it's going to be possible from voice-activated home assistants. But, but the biggest area which for us in medicine where it's become available is through the uh, High Tech Act and, and the money that was made available in order to incentivize through meaningful use the adoption of, of digital data within electronic health systems. And no matter how many times I look at this figure, uh, it does amaze me that in a relatively rapid period of about 10 years, we've gone uh, to almost full penetration within major medical centers and, and that virtually uh, people have gotten the functions of, of the EHR in almost every setting. We have truly undergone a digital transformation within healthcare. Uh, this is a figure supplied by ONC, but, but even as we still live in a paper culture, and, and despite the fact that they sit in, it, we've got it digitized, you all know this problem of the interoperability, but this is an article that just appeared last month in Health Affairs, Progress in Interoperability, Measuring U.S. Hospitals' Engagement in Sharing Patient Data. I thought it should have been titled Lack of Progress in Interoperability because they, what they said was our results reveal that hospitals' progress is slow and is focused on moving information between hospitals, and it does so poorly and not on ensuring usability of the information in clinical decision, and it could have gone on to say, <clears throat> and not in ensuring that, that people are able to more easily get their data to which they are entitled. So this FDA report, Evgen, also said, even as it said, fortunately, more data is becoming available, and our capabilities on the analytics side is growing, it also said this, less fortunately, these rich data sources remain siloed, often unavailable, or inaccessible to many. It's, it's kind of like that Coleridge poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. We are surrounded by data, 
Every industry around us, particularly retailing, is finding ways to leverage it, use it, understand it, apply it, profit from it. Uh, but in medicine, uh, the evolutionary pressure has been lacking. And so despite the fact that we've had this transformation, we, we are not in a fundamentally different position with regard to that data, I believe, than we were at the start of the adoption. We talk about a continuously learning healthcare system. This is a figure from the IOM report in 2012. It is a lovely, wonderful vision for the future, one in which we're talking about how data generated in the everyday practice of medicine ends up uh, teaching us something and then falling back into that practice to improve care, and we learn from that as well as providing platforms for trials. But we have, we have not even begun to actualize this in any way, shape, or form. The back to the Evgen document, which I find I, I really recommend to people. It's a, it's a really wonderful piece of work. It was I think the problem statement was well articulated here. Again, this is only out in January. What is needed is an approach for integrating previously isolated data platforms in a way that ensures that available information collected during healthcare related activities, medical research, medical product development, clinical care, can be brought to bear for the benefit of all. So Great problem statement. What is needed is an approach to do that. Um, and again, back to Dr. Califf, we have an obligation to create a more robust evidence ecosystem to support more informed decision making and ultimately longer and better lives for patients and the public. So up till now, what I've been trying to do is frame this problem statement because I, I think that there's widespread agreement both within and out of government. Certainly patients recognize it. And the notion that we need an approach that solves the problem. We, 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 we great job on digitizing the data, but now we need to figure out how to make sure that it is used in a positive way. And the former commissioner even goes as far as saying, we have an obligation to do this. It, I would just say in the Cures Act, there's also the push towards real world evidence to help support the approval of new indications for drugs and to support or satisfy post-approval study requirement is, again, more impetus in this direction. This was in December of uh, 2016, and it was really beginning to lay this groundwork for what needed to happen. But th the question is how to, how to do this. And so um, I think this is the critical issue that we need to grapple with and try to solve. Um, again, you know, I, I think we can talk about how you circumnavigate the, you, you know, uh, South America, uh, how you get down around the, around the bottom faster, or you figure out if you want to get from East Coast to West Coast with shipping goods, you got to do it a different way. And again, you know, there's precedent in our history of beginning to think about we just can't keep going faster in the same routes that we've been following. We need to think about whether or not there are new routes that somehow open up the possibility of being able to do things better in fundamentally different ways that shift the way we think about things. Now, in this space, we've got constraints that we have to navigate. We have to figure out the navigation of HIPAA and privacy, business associate agreements and contracts, the formats of the data, the pure information blocking that is often occurring, and more. There's a lot of constraints here that, that, that make this a very difficult task. And I, I just want to linger for a second on what need to be the properties of the solution. Well, in order to implement something that works, it needs to be easy. The data needs to be timely. By the way, we have some solutions where it's great, but we hear about the data in six months or eight months. It needs to be timely. We need a comprehensive look at the data that tell the true story of the patient's experience. There needs to be a bi-directionality so that people both can move data from place to place in these secure ways and needs to be affordable. I also want to interject this. I think the properties of solution with regard to people and their data, back to the title and the focus, it needs to be respectful, honoring people's, uh, that it's people's data. Uh, it needs to be engaging of people. It needs to be empowering of people. And I think this, the properties of the solution is it needs to be done in collaboration with people and with the permission of people. We have for too long pursued courses where people have been incidental. How do we get their data? Of course, we're working to help them. 
but they don't need to be involved. I had someone tell me people are a point of failure in any system that tries to learn from the experience of patients. You want to try to work around the patients. You want to try to get an IRB that says you don't have to pay any attention to the patient. And I think that it's possible to think that the actual solution may be one in which we think about people in the middle and actually one in which we are collaborating actively with people and working with them in partnership and with their permission in ways that that begin to usher in a very different way of thinking about how this works. And for everybody has got a story, right? What's, what's their story? And the only one who can really characterize the journey of someone through an illness, through treatment, through prevention, through health, is actually that person It has to be at the center of that. Because all that other data, everything else, is all sitting in very different places. The only common thing is that it's about a person. And that's the only way the story gets told, in a longitudinal and continuous way. And not just in the clinical encounters, but in the course of their behaviors and in their experiences and their symptoms, their feelings, their function. All of these things through their daily activities tell the story of their health, tell the story of their experience with illness and health, and with the treatments and strategies that are, uh, are uh, used in, in the interim. And, and so, I, as I started thinking about this, started conceptualizing that, that what we're really trying to do is build communities, not cohorts. It's not cohorts to study, but it's communities to foster who are working together to try to generate solutions that may help them, but may help others as well. Partners, not patients. Participants, not, not just data donors, but actually people who are participants who are respected in that way. And, and I'll say this last one is, Teammates, not mascots. And, and I don't say this that anyone was intending, ever intends, to denigrate the contributions of people who are parts of studies. And I just said the mascot in the sense of symbols of the study rather than active, authentic, genuine uh, partners in the study. Teammates who are working with us together in order to try to reach goals that are of mutual interest and, in fact, imperative uh, for both groups. Now, th these ideas have been percolating for a while. They're not just, obviously, not just in my mind, but, but many people have got these. And, and my inspiration for this has come from many sources. Um, I had the honor of serving on the advisory committee to the director of the NIH at a time when uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative Cohort Program was being conceptualized, and it became a subgroup of our committee that came back and presented to our committee. And in September of 2015, while I was still on that, that group, the report was submitted, and it was really interesting. The, the, one of the key recommendations, which we were all excited about, was that the PMI, now called all of us, by the way, but, but at that time, Precision Medicine Initiative, should support the development and evaluation of tools that enable individuals, people, to acquire, transmit, and continuously update their electronic health record data to the PMI cohort from multiple provider organizations. Now, I almost want to stop when it says update their EHR data because what a marvelous thing that would be to just have people be able to acquire, transmit, and continuously update their data. But that, then they would have the potential to be able to send it to the cohort, the so-called sync for science idea. And if you look in that report, this is another very important statement that was made in it. Participants, and by the way, notice these are participants, not patients. Participants will be the primary source of many research observations, of course, but listen to this, co-designers of studies, mediators of access to their healthcare data, contributors to the overall data quality control, donators of data, and you know how I feel about donators now, but that, that's fine, donators of data from mobile and wearable devices, and recipients of their own as well as aggregate data and analysis results. This is a visionary statement of the way in which we can proceed forward to understand and generate knowledge from a whole wide range of sources and for a whole wide range of reasons, not just for the PMI, but post-market surveillance, or a whole wide range of potential applications that say we can begin to think about this whole enterprise in a very different way. And notice the end, they can also receive their results back and have their own data assets grow. Sue Desmond, who, who runs the Gates Foundation, and uh, someone who uh, has had experience in academia and industry and now at Gates and just a remarkable person, 
She said, I believe that the most important requirement for new knowledge in network, the most important requirement for the new knowledge network envisioned by the precision medicine report is that it be driven by patients. In this piece that she wrote, she really recognized that actually even more than the knowledge that might be generated from PMI was the introduction of a new paradigm that could be leveraged. As you know, uh, NIH and ONC have announced a thing for science. That they're, they're, tr they're trying out a bunch of ways in which this can go. From a presentation that was given in June, I took this slide, where it's safe for science, which uh, actually was trademarked by HHS, said with a click of a button, you'll be able to voluntarily share your health data to help scientists perform groundbreaking, groundbreaking research. This doesn't adequately, I think, convey the notion of the partnership, but it's, it's there. And, you know, they've, they've got an app, and the notion is that data, you know, they, that that people log into portals and there's, then there's approving the sharing and they're pushing the notion again of, of this new paradigm. And, and I will say that I think in all of this, we're still a little bit of kitty hop. There's lots of issues to work out. This is a new way of thinking for people as well as for organizations, let alone the scientists and the government. And, uh, it's one that, that it still has, a, you know, a, a many potential obstacles and impediments to it. But, but we can see it beginning to happen. And, and I always think the amazing thing about Kitty Hawk was this picture from the original flight is in 1903. Within a decade, uh, it, it's, it's normative to have planes in the air. In fact, World War I is, you know, uh, it, one of the things that's notable about it is that all of a sudden there become air forces and that, uh, planes become, uh, much more routine. And, uh, in this, this, very small flight just in 1903 presages a very big change that occurs. So going back to this document, the FDA also said this clearly in this, in this document. The recognition that patients have control of their own healthcare records provides both a means to increase data sharing and a force to organize on the basis of common interests and focus on evidence generation most germane to the needs of patients. So again, you're seeing this groundswell and in, in this document they begin to talk about again that in the old world you know stuff sitting in different this way clouds but you know everything separated in the future that the data is coming together, I would have liked them to show lines coming into the person in the middle so it's not just data around that person but data that that person actually can have some agency over and some ability to share at will I think what was very interesting in this document was the guiding principles. There were more than this, but their top three were a holistic end-to-end -end patient-centered approach. This is about enhancing the current state of evidence generation. Guiding principle, end-to-end -end patient-centered approach, promotion of the convergence of routine clinical care and research, bringing the research worlds and clinical care worlds together, and robust systems of safeguards for privacy, confidentiality, and security. Going back to that one document from all of the leaders of HHS agencies regarding health and others, we've come to recognize the essential role that the perspectives of patients and consumers play in shaping the methods, goals, and outcomes of medical research and interventions. And, and they could have said the role in, in helping to coalesce, organize, and then share and improve the data resources that are used for research. So I think we're at a critical juncture now here with regard to this effort. And when I want to tell you that I've had a lot of people say, well, this is, this is just never going to work, right? I mean, how is it that people are going to start doing this stuff? I mean, it's their health data. And they're not going to want to see it moving like this. They're not going to want to share it. Well, you know, the studies actually say that most people for good purposes would be willing to share their, their health data. In fact, 70 to 80% of people would be willing to do it if it was for a reason that was good and with people that they trusted. But the reason I'm showing this slide is to say that, you know, the world changes. And if it, if it can serve people in a positive way, you won't believe how fast it can change. So think about the banking industry. I mean, if I went to people in whether small town or big town America, not that long ago, and I said, you know, what do you think about giving up your teller? You know, I, I, we would have gotten a lot of responses about, well, what do you mean? I mean, I, I go to the bank, I, I, I want to deal with a person, and this is about my money, and I, I don't want to, you know. And, I, and we said to them, well, you know, you might end up putting your money into a machine, and that 
they just trust that that machine will, you know, take care of it and deposit it in your right account and everything like that. I, I think people would have, would have thought you were a little crazy to think that the banking industry, because it was all about personal interactions to head to head. It, it, and people were very, uh, concerned about that kind of money thing. But, but, you know, the tellers today are, uh, many fewer than what we've had in the past. And people got very used to the convenience, the reliability, the safety, security of being able to do their banking digitally. Many people online, ATMs are now, uh, you know, just part of the way in which people transact. In a relatively short period of time, the whole thing changed. The whole thing changed. And yet, if you would have talked to people that moment, they, they, they're friends with the person who's at the bank. They know the teller. They like to hand their cash over to a person who they like to watch count the money and then give them a paper receipt that dem demonstrated that they had deposited it, a deposit slip. And, and all that changed because, because technology enabled it to change and, and it demonstrated it was a it was a trustworthy system. I think the key on the healthcare side is being able to, to, to demonstrate the power of collective action of people being able to have agency over their data and seeing what happens when it's, it, it, what it can do in, in aggregate as people work together. Social capital, but the mutual benefit also. People have to see that, that when it works like this, that, that they benefit. And one of the metaphors I like to use is that of, of one of the like ways or, or, you know, where people are using it for roads. These are based on information being collected from a lot of different sources, but including from people. And the reason that I can know that the road's clear a mile ahead is because the data that's being generated from the person who's driving a mile ahead of me benefits me. And the person a mile behind me is benefited from the knowledge about whether what the traffic's like where I am. And although we can argue about whether or not anybody asks us that, that for our data, our GPS data to be used in this way, we, we kind of come, most of us come to peace with it because it actually provides a substantial benefit with regard to the person who's ahead of us or the person who's behind us. The power to generate data together is the idea that knowledge generated in everyday practice, each person can be better off for the contributions of the person ahead of them and helping the people who follow them. And if you take it to the studies, the studies are more relevant, efficient, and impactful for their participatory nature. The notion of the person who's a mile ahead of me in the road of my illness knows things that can help me. And their experience with the healthcare system their results can can help inform my choice. And if we do this right, then what's happened to me helps the person who's a mile behind me in this illness or hasn't even been diagnosed or even uh, put in a position where, where they know anything about it yet. Now, the key thing here is that the, the HIPAA of 1996 provides not only health information privacy rights, it says you have a right to access your health information, a right to a disclosure of your health information, and a right to correct or amend your health care information. This is when the, when the all of us folks are talking about that people can be part of the quality control. It's because people looking at their records can actually make, make corrections. And here's the important thing about the uh, patient rights part, is that accessing and obtaining copies of one's health information for one's own purpose is a right, not a privilege which, which is fundamental to your ability to participate in our healthcare system. This comes from an ONC document. It says that despite all these constraints, HIPAA, all these things, when I'm trying to get my own data, there's no HIPAA there. That's me. That's me getting my data. And by the way, the, the federal regulations say I'm entitled to it. And not only am I entitled to it, but the right extends to a broad array of information. Lab results, images, prescriptions, notes, and by the way, it applies to all covered entities. So pharmacies, laboratories, even payers, as well as to, uh, as I said, to all these data holders. So, and another important piece is per page charges do not apply when the individual is requesting a copy of information maintained electronically. So if we start moving the digital data actually without having to have any sorts of other arrangements, people have a right to their stuff. So the question is, how will all this occur? And, you know, it, it, at least I'm going to present at least one solution, what we're doing with Hugo, but there, I hope there will be many solutions and many different approaches to this because it's, it's the time for us to begin to develop the strategies and tools that are going to make this work. Now, Mint is a means by which people connect to different 
financial accounts in order to bring it, harmonize it, organize it in one place. And uh, the question was sort of like, why isn't there something like that in healthcare, which enabled people to be the engine for the interoperability? So th this is why we created this Hugo. And like I said, I'm not here to push Hugo in particular, but to, I'm at least presenting it as an example of where we're trying to go with this kind of idea, that we should be able to not only create the, the need for an approach, not only articulate that this is a problem, but to recognize that putting people in the middle requires the tools to, to make this seamless. And so what we've tried to do is create an easy-to-use cloud-based solution that enables the secure acquisition, harmonization, utilization of health-related data from EHRs, billing systems, surveys, wearables, sensors, medical devices, anything can come together. And the steps are the connection of the individual to the data sources, the automated transmission, and then underneath it, the software is validating, normalizing, standardizing, mapping, maintaining a dynamic database, but then ensuring that there's easy ways for people to be able to share. So in the, in the way this works is there are data sources, there's an app that can go to the cloud, and there's permission to move from the data sources to the person's own personal database. And then if they want to send it somewhere, there's, they need to authorize that. So everything, in our view, should be permission-based. There's no de-identification and selling behind people's backs. There's no movement of data without. This is about helping people to have the ability to manage their own data and uh, see their own timeline of their health encounters or answer questions about uh, how they feel and have that become part of their health record or bring in data from Fitbits or other wearables. And it can come from a whole range of different sources. And so what we've done is try to embark upon an effort to see whether or not this can become a mediator of a means for which people can gain agency over their data and be able to use it for uh, virtuous purposes. And so uh, I'm introducing the idea of NEST. NEST is the National Evaluation System for Health Technologies. They're seeking to improve the use of real-world evidence generated in the routine course of clinical care. They named some demonstration projects for which they wanted to highlight. And two of the projects that uh, uh, were named are using this mHealth uh, uh, strategy in order to see whether or not uh, it's possible to be able to put people in the center, help them aggregate the data, and share it into, in this case, uh, active surveillance uh, uh, projects. In one case, Medtronic working with Yale and Hugo. In another case, the Yale Mayo Searcy and the FDA, Johnson & Johnson and Hugo, for different conditions seeing whether there's a proof of concept for, for active surveillance of approved devices. In addition, we're working with the American College of Cardiology on a pilot, the use of mHealth platform to augment clinical registry with longitudinal follow-up in the collection of patient-reported outcome measures. In the end, at, at some point, there may be able to be virtual registries in which people are actually enrolled in the registries, and their data is flowing to them and then into the registry, much in the same way that the Sync for Science is envisioned to work for uh, the, all of us. But in the course of the ACC, these are screenshots for what would appear for people in terms of pushing PROMs. Now, so in, the, in the end, we're going to need to optimize many of these PROMs for the mobile technologies, but this is the SAC-7, which is a standard approved, a very common uh, 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 PROM, patient report outcome measure, that's used in cardiology. And, and this is, these are separate screenshots that people would be getting through the course of that. And in the end, these, these data sources begin to be able to paint a picture of someone's experience. It's longitudinal and continuous. We're going to need to work on, on this. To, it can function as a data asset manager, essentially a health information fiduciary, but also a tool of empowerment. As we begin this strategy, again, whether it's Hugo or, or some other method, but it begins to become a way in which we are really actually engaging people as partners and we are respecting the fact they have agency over their data and want to work with them. And by the way, they don't have to be monogamous. Once they've got their data that way, they can share with other people as well. So coming to the, to the end here, I've tried to, to uh, move rapidly because we were started a little bit late. But the properties of the solution, again, the, the whole notion here is providing tools that help us work in collaboration with people and recognize that the use of people's data should be with their permission. In the same way that the use of their biospecimens or samples or 
you go back to the Henrietta Lacks uh, uh, example, that, that we need to be working with people in front of them with their knowledge. And we'll get, I believe, better, uh, better results. As the internet changed everything, it's not its pure existence that changes it, it's the way in which all of this is applied. The, the, we are not waiting thing, uh, uh, construct, the idea, the notion of what it's like for people who are facing these health challenges needs to get us to move rapidly to try to create this new paradigm that enables people to be part of the solution. I, I do want to be clear, data is necessary but not sufficient. Just pulling the data together is not going to solve the problem. But if we don't find ways to unify, integrate, and organize and harmonize the data in the very different uh, uh, venues, then shame on us for delaying the generation of the kind of knowledge that's desperately needed by so many within the healthcare system. So I acknowledge that it's not ever was before. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so I know we're a little bit over time, but I'd still like to open it up um, for questions if people can hang around for the next five minutes or so. Um, so if you're online, you can please go ahead and type in your questions and I'll ask them on your behalf. Or if you're in the room, there's a wireless mic that I can pass around or the mic's on the table. Come on. Question. Hi, I just wanted to add to this discussion. I think it was really well done. Um, I just wanted to bring up also in the veteran population the Blue Button app that are trying to do similar activities. And we also learned of a project that CMS has been doing in which they actually had to shut it down because too many people were sharing their data and maybe didn't have the capacity because if you think about it, if your mother ends up in the emergency room with, let's say, a hypoglycemic event, you are invested also to make sure that your mother does not end up back in the emergency room. So patients who are involved in this data sharing model, this is actually done on a kiosk, which was in an app. So to me, I was quite amazed given that people actually had to go to a kiosk and enter in you know, their, their mother's information or their patient information. So I really do think that this is quite um, you know, intriguing and I do see the importance of it. And I do see like within the veteran population, there has been some movement in the suicide prevention and also the blue button and the get that help app. So I do see this movement towards, you know, mobile app and data sharing. Yeah, and I just want to give a shout out to the VA where Blue Button, Peter Levin, and, you know, the group there, you know, was developing it, I think, as they moved to, to the new HR. And they, I hope that they'll be putting in place fire in, the, in OAuth 2 and the ability really to seamlessly move data. And I think, uh, thank you for, for shouting out the VA and also the, the Million Veterans Study is also, I think, trying to be very inventive about the way in which they're leveraging data. Hi, this is Frank Weichold. I have an additional question. Thank you for the presentation and discussion. Um, the uh, opportunity to liberate health data and exchange data is certainly in, in some ways able to generate a value. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Because uh, obviously the data itself, if it's not cleaned and not structured, has some challenges. And I know that you've been probably thinking in the context of your Hugo, uh, how to do this best to create a value. Um, but I think the key 
incentive, in particularly in, in a society driven by economy and profit, uh, probably is a value generation for secondary use, so that any person can share its or his data um, to um, through a, let's say data bank or or honest broker and make it accessible for a reuse or secondary use uh, against a value exchange. So in a way, it's like a, a health data exchange market. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks very much. I think you know one of the things that's bothered me is that there's a secondary market in data where through these agreements, there are companies that are pulling out all the data from the hospitals and then now they've got everyone's data, no one knows they have their data. They're monetizing it, de-identifying it, selling it. But everybody but the patients and the people get a chance actually to have their own data assets organized and be able to leverage it in, in the ways that they want. I, I think for many people, the value is getting as many people as possible working on the condition they have in order to race to try to bring knowledge that's going to help them, or if they've got a drug or device, having people make sure they know the latest information. And so that, that's a value in and of itself. But I also think it, it's possible that as people aggregate, uh, for there will be other purposes for which people may be interested in working with collective groups for with their data, and there may be opportunities for different kinds of value. But I see immense value in the longitudinal continuous data that's held by individuals that can be collectively leveraged to generate knowledge. And and so, I, I mean, I think that there are po lo tons of possibilities around that. And, and you know, the guys from Harvard, Mandela, and Payne have, have written about the health information sort of economy on a consumer-mediated information exchange. And I think that, again, if you can give people some agency over their data that there will be many opportunities for that to be beneficial to people, even potentially financially. Hi, um, my name is Mark Walter Haug, and, and Dr. Beicholt has uh, anticipated one of my questions, which you've just addressed about the monetization or securitization of data. My, my second question had to do with um, a discussion that we've had at FDA earlier this year um, we had a presenter from uh, from one of the health maintenance organizations talk about the fact that uh, electronic health records are probably not as good a source of information as we are anticipating in the sense that um, they're not designed for public health use and that uh, there are certain limitations about it. And I was wondering, I guess this also touches on the data quality question. Yeah, I've heard that uh, from time to time, and what I tell people is, I, what I hear generally is to say, I'm not sure if the HR data is good enough for research. And I say, well, you know it's used for clinical care, and actually people's lives are on the line. And, and if you're saying that, we, we need to think about the data quality for the everyday transactions that are occurring in the healthcare system, which you're right, it's not as strong as it ought to be. But, but you know, there's a lot of good information that can be gleaned, that, even for which we're depending on claims now. I mean, healthcare utilization, the labs, the vitals, the radiology reports. I mean, these things aren't aren't necessarily the same as if you would have core labs, but they provide a lot of insight. And then if you take unstructured data and can use natural language processing and other methods, <clears throat> there's lots to glean. That being said, we also can't be, we need to be realistic about what can be extracted given words like shock can mean very different things to very different people. So there are things that I think are more and less trustworthy that reliable, maybe accurate within the healthcare record, and you know this is going to open it up. I think for us to begin to both think about what, where should we prioritize in the quality of data, first and foremost for clinical care, but also where is it that we can be in a position where we know what the priority critical elements are that need to be tended to for a whole wide range of purposes that will help us uh, learn faster in healthcare. So I, I see this as, a, as not an insurmountable challenge, but it's an important thing to acknowledge. And something for us to dig into, and not a reason to despair about the HR, but but we do need to be realistic about what's in there. Hi, uh, this is Carol Linden, also from Orsi. I really enjoyed your your discussion. Um, it seems to me that there's a little bit of the use of the terms data and information sort of interchangeably, and I was just wondering. Uh, what your thoughts are on, especially from the perspective of an individual uh, getting value out of their data, tr how that data gets translated for 
a person into useful information with respect to their health or treatment or whatever. Yeah, I, I think that in, it, so this is kind of a, I think in the, what would happen in the long run, how would this work? And I, I think in, in the end, the data is what feeds into systems that end up doing filtering and organization. People by themselves just carrying around your information that would, that's sort of automatically collected for you that shows your history in a way that's understandable and clear could be beneficial for you to be able to transfer care or to get second opinions or to, if you end up in the emergency room to be able to show people what's happened to you. But but even beyond that, we may get to a place where um, there, even for some people who are interested, there can maybe decision support that can layer on top of it that at least opens people's minds to how they, you know, how they can report things about their device or how they can be able to participate in generating knowledge about what's going on and be able to see how people like them are also responding around, build communities where they're sharing knowledge and information and wisdom. And, I, you know, I, I can see it more as a middleware that just like when you see the weather, I mean, you don't see all the data that's streaming into from all the sensors and, and sources. You're seeing a map that has something useful to you. And I think that in the end, the data that's going to come in will need to be translated into something that's informative and, and useful to people that helps either them promote their own health or for which they feel is important because, like I said, it helps the person a mile behind them, and they were helped by the person a mile ahead of them. Thank you. So we just have one more quick question from a remote person online. Jim Simpson asks, have you developed a method to perform a firm profile, product profile, or technology profile? Maybe I, I need some help to understand what that question is. <laughs> what, what, do you know what it means? I don't. Jim, if you're there, can you please elaborate in the chat box? He may have dropped off the line. Um, Okay. In that case, I want to thank everyone um, for your patience with the technical difficulties and thank our Yale um, colleagues for helping us to troubleshoot and special thanks to Dr. Crummels for the thought-provoking presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Virtual applause. <laughs> uh, you know, that's so appreciated because I usually... <laughs> thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Is that one of those?